Sandeep Sen, a visionary CEO, is a social entrepreneur and a veteran in the IT ITES domain with over 25 years of experience. He started his career with the UB Group, followed by a pioneering stint in the head of marketing and network head at Hutchinson Telecom India. Prior to ages, in 2001, he founded the Customer First Services, one of India's leading CRM companies, and supported several blue chip companies in India in the telecom, banking, retail, hospitality, and technology segments. In 2006, Customer First Services was acquired by Aegis. He contributed exponentially to the Aegis growth story as a market maker and brand builder, and over the years has engineered spectacular success chapters for Aegis. He has been instrumental in building the company's global business across countries like India, the US, South Africa, Australia, Philippines, and the UK. From less than USD 60, 60 million revenues, his strategic insights and execution capabilities helped architect Aegis into a USD 1 billion company with over 55,000 employees across 13 countries from 85 nationalities. He has an honours graduate in economics from Presidency College, Kolkata, and has a Master of Business Administration from our very own XLRA Junction. With over two decades of customer-centric expertise in consumer, telecom, and BPO sector, he is a forward-looking thinker who has led a radical business transformation for ages through his intellect, professional expertise, and experiences. He is currently the global CEO of Ages Limited and SR Enterprise. I would like you all to welcome Sir on stage with a warm round of applause. Mr. Sandeep Chen has been an exceptional achiever and has contributed immensely to the industry. We would like to present him the Synergy Excellence Award for making XLRI proud. Can I please call on stage Professor Saras Sari to present this award.
So I thought I'd start with explaining a little bit of it just before we come to the solution of the subject. In the of the company that I head up, uh, we currently have about uh, 40,000 people in 46 sites, uh, doing about uh, 200 clients of what we call a brilliant moments of truth. Uh, just the background of that gives some idea of this disruption that I talk about. Aegis was a struggling company in about 2004, about $60 million in revenue, doing about $16, $17 million of loss. So our parent company, the SR Group, said, you know, we want to get into this video business. We are a company which is oil and steel, so how do we get into a business which is more contemporary, modern, and we want to this company. A struggling company based in Dallas, Texas. Now the conventional wisdom was that when you take over a company and you are in the outsourcing business, you will outsource everything to the but what we realized was this Aegis, while it was a struggling company, had great clients. So if I give an analogy by saying, look, it makes good cakes, but it had a very poor storefront. So it had a good bakery, but it didn't have a great storefront. So we said, we will invest in front-facing activities. We will invest in activities like sales, like customer relations, like account management in the US. facing activities and what we will uh, kind of offshore is what we call the BPO for a BPO. So we will offshore the back end, the finance and accounts and things like that. Thereafter what we did, so we, we met this US thing group and then we said look we need a good delivery center, we need back end and we made a couple of acquisitions in India and one of the companies that I had started those days was customer first which we just acquired and that's how I came into customer first. So we then had the US, the front end, we had the back end in India. And we realized that if we are going to get US customers, we need a lot of other geographies, Philippines being one of them, because Philippines is a major geography for US customers. So we made another acquisition whereby we acquired centers in Philippines and Costa Rica. And therefore now we had an off onshore in the US, we had an offshore in India and Philippines, and we had what we call a near shore in Costa Rica. And that's how we've grown as a result of both organic growth and acquisitions. Uh, then we wanted to do the entire English speaking world, so we made acquisitions in Australia, South Africa, we organically grew in the UK, and then we said once we've done the English speaking world, the next phase is in terms of size, geography, market, in Spanish, and then we were in Argentina and Peru. And that's really how you see the, how we have given uh, kind of growth. And over a period of time, because of acquisitions, because of growth, we grew to be a billion dollars company. In 2014, we did two deleveraging. We sold our technology company called AGC because that was not growing at the same rate as we were. We were trying to look at the value of the company. And we also sold our US assets to another company called Teleperformance at a very high valuation, at a very high what we call multiple EBITDA. Thereafter, we were trying to focus on the Asia Pacific region. So we have centers like Malaysia, uh, centers in Saudi, and we've grown the business in Asia and Pacific. And this is what you see today. So we really have, between 2006 and 2016, are on the highest rates of growth uh, of, of the BPO. And what we focus on, as you said, is both voice, non-voice, as well as a lot of new technology and applications like social, social mobile applications and cloud. And some of them will be related to disruption, which I will speak to you. And one of the reasons why we have been so successful is that we've always had an approach which is very entrepreneurial. We wanted to kind of be agile, to collaborate with customers, to be flexible. Apart from the fact that we've always had uh, you know, very long customer relationships, a lot of focus on quality and consistency. So that's really the ages journey. A journey we used to call from bankruptcy to millions. Bankruptcy because when we acquired the company in 2005, it was virtually a bankrupt company losing 16, 18 million uh, dollars a year to the fact that we became about a billion dollars in 2014. Having, and now having sold, we are roughly about 500 million dollars. But I don't want to bore you with that, I just want to give a background because some of what I'm going to talk about ages is related to disruption and a lot of what uh, you will hear about me saying is also related to what we're doing as far as ages is concerned.
Okay. And now we come to your whole disruption thing. What is disruption? I thought there was no better way to take a quote from Charles Darwin, because he's the guy who, and because my topic is something about digital Darwinism, and I explain what it is. And what Charles Darwin says that it is not the strongest or the most intelligent who will survive, but those who can best manage change. It's not necessarily the strongest guy, the most intelligent guy, the most adaptable guy. And that's the guy who can manage change. That's the guy who will survive. And digital Darwinism is a term uh, given by an American theorist and American marketer called Brian Solis, who says, when technology and society change faster than companies. You know, organizations are, are, are trying to adapt, but what happens when technology and society changes f f faster, changes at a better pace, changes at a more furious pace? That's when you have this problem of digital Darwinism. And one example, and there are many, obviously the Fortune 500 list was in 1955, 430 companies, almost 500 are not there, and that is happening. In fact, if you look at every 10 years, the rate of change in the Fortune 500, just as one example, you can take S&P 500, you can take any other, is changing rapidly. What it means is that if you were if you were great 100 years back, it doesn't mean that you will be there today. Why? Because you've not been able to adapt. It would be one reason. Now, disruption is really speeding up, and these are just examples I put. Just to illustrate what we are saying, one example could be of books. You know, the Gutenberg Bible was about 573 years ago. And the Kindle, so from the Bible to the Kindle, it took about 573 years. So from the printed matter to something at hand. But look at how things are changing. How this disruption is getting smaller and smaller. You know, from magazines to, uh, the, uh, to the Apple iPad. Uh, the latest one could be from, what should I say, uh, let's say the music one from the record to the CD to iTunes and to an application like Spotify, many of you use them, these have become smaller and smaller. So instead of taking hundreds of years, they're taking 20 years, 30 years, 5 years. That's the pace at which disruption is happening. And you can look at any examples which shows that the disruption curve is changing. And something that you guys are obviously doing as part of your studies is that, I'm sorry, I, 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 don't, I don't know what's the problem that these should come slightly better. Uh, on your screen is not coming as good. But on the left is the standard uh, adoption model that you know, the guys who are the early adopters, the early majority and all of that. But look at the actual disruption curves. Uh, I don't know how much you can read. This is the US example, these are actual disruption curves. The older ones which are more gradual were the car, the car is 100 years old, from Henry Ford's uh, Model T, to the aeroplane, uh, to, uh, for example, complexity. But look at these disruption curves. These are the mobile phone, these are the internet. So, and so what this shows is the number of years that these have been invented. The car has been invented for 100 years, the aeroplane for about 80 years. And this is the number of ownership in America. The top is 100%, the bottom is 0%. So for example, the car is 100 years, uh, the ownership level in America today is about 80, 85%. But the uh, mobile phone or the smartphone, maybe 10 years, the construction is 70%. So what this shows is the rate of disruption is getting much higher. The rate of disruption in the earlier examples of a car or an aeroplane or electricity or, or the normal telephone, which you call the plane or telephone system, you know, it takes 70, 80, 90 years for a majority of people to, uh, to use it. But if you look at the modern ones like internet or mobile phone, it's far, far higher. And that's really the whole disruption that we are talking about. <coughs> so it's in fact a revolution. Uh, why do I say this whole disruption, this whole technology is a new revolution? Look at the old ones. The first one was the agricultural revolution, where what you did is that man was nomadic, and so agriculture became settled. So that's the first revolution. Obviously, there was writing and printing, which gave this whole knowledge that we're talking about today. Then came the industrial revolution. The industrial revolution was where uh, you used the spinning jetty, power looms, and you really built up the industry that you have today. And this one is the the internet, the mobile, the computing revolution. So this disruption that we're talking about is being driven by this internet and mobile revolution. And why it is so? What has been that in the last 10 years there has been so much disruption that we're talking about? It is the internet, but much more than the internet, it's the ecosystem which has happened. And what is the ecosystem we're talking about? Okay, uh, I just got an example. This is from a book I was reading, and this is US 2014 which shows that the internet is absolutely omnipresent. We all know that. 
I was loving some of these examples and I decided to put it and now the numbers will be much more, which says 95% of people use an electronic device for an hour before going to bed. Over 90% sleep next to their cell phones. 60% of people text while driving. So it shows how ubiquitous this is. Everybody is using it. There's a number which has gone up. How many people use uh, mobile phones in their bathrooms? So we are really talking about something which is really, really strict. But what has happened? Yes, the internet is omnipresent. Everybody uses it. Why is it a revolution? Why is it causing disruption? And the reason it is causing disruption is because of the ecosystem which has happened. You have the internet. You have the internet now for 20, 25 years. But now what you have, you have the mobile phone. So you have internet at the hand, internet of everybody's, uh, you know, thumb, so to say. And then you have social networks. So you have the internet, you have the mo mo mobility, you have the mobile phone, and then you have social networks, WhatsApp, Facebook, etc. And there is computing, which can give billions of data uh, allowed to be computed. As a result of this ecosystem, as a result of the confluence of all of that, you've got now a revolution because whether it's a Uber app or whether it is any of the millions of apps we're using all. It is a confluence of all that. It is the net. It is the mobile that you have in your hand. It is the social network that you're using. And it is the ability to compute billions of terabytes of data. And that is what is leading to this disruption that we're talking about. And these are some hard numbers. Just to put some numbers, these are 2015 numbers. I think that 2016 numbers will come sometime here. Which say that the world population is about 7 billion. The active internet users are about 3 billion. The uh, social media is about 2 billion, unique mobile is 3.6 billion, etc. Now look at that and look at that with your disruption. Half the world's population have unique mobile phones. So the, if you look at hard numbers, you know, these numbers tell you that this is really something which is now the most ubiquitous thing. 60% of the people having mobile phones, 55% having uh, social media connections. And if you look at the 2016 numbers which haven't come out, so there was some discussion I was seeing in a magazine these numbers are going up dramatically. So these are hard numbers to show why the digital mobility is taken over. And another example, and all of us have mobile phones and all of us take photos, and this is obviously the reason for the depth of the uh, normal camera, the Kodak camera, etc. Look at digital photographs. The digital photographs have really gone up leaps and bounds uh, to, you know, they, they, they were about uh, 177 per person. You don't see the numbers there, this was 322 per person last year and 100 and 255 billion photographs. So if you're going to take 255 billion photographs on your digital phone, what will happen to the four cameras and the guys who don't have that? So that's the spread of this revolution. And I just put these numbers to show that we all talk about it, we all, but it's not high, it's actually exact numbers that's happening. <laughs> now we talk about disruption, we talk about success strategy in the age of disruption. So what about the companies which are not successful? What about the companies which are not in? We've got to take a lesson out of them. And these are examples, of course. Uh, the one you see on your left is Borders, which is a bookshop. And there's Borders of Barnes & Noble's a bookshop. Kodak, of course, is the camera company. Uh, Nokia is the phone company. And Nokia is interesting because for a while I was working at Hutchison Telecom. And uh, for many years, as a matter of fact. And if you look at Nokia from 2006 to 2012, they were selling more than 6 million phones a month in India. 6 million is the is more than the population of Finland from where Nokia comes from. So in India they are adding actually one Finland a month. That was a success. But obviously this whole disruption, smartphones, not understanding where the uh, new uh, trends are going means that more Nokia is not there. So that's a live example for somebody which was successful not just worldwide, but very very successful in India are not there. The other examples that I've got are very standard examples, but the reason to give these is to reinforce the fact that we are really in an age of disruption. <coughs> the, the one on the left is Enthagrio Britannica. I remember when I was young, uh, my parents spent a lot of money and bought this, which used to cost some 10, 12,000 rupees. Now, obviously, today with the Wikipedia and all the information on that, I was just speaking with like, to somebody who sells Enthagrio Britannica. They used to sell the hard volumes, then they sold the CD, and now they stopped the whole company. Right? Uh, travel, of course, is another example where the travel agent uh, has completely been replaced. And we do, we are the largest partners worldwide for Expedia. So we've seen how the travel business has been completely taken over by the digital storm. I mean, you still have a little bit, but 
$74 billion last year was the increase of travel on e-commerce platform alone. One of the other things getting disrupted, of course, e-commerce. Uh, again, we can, I can speak from knowledge because we do a lot of work for Flipkart and Amazon. And what they're really looking at in e-commerce is not the fact that it is cheap. It is cheap today and it's enticing you to buy. But they're looking at what they call as customization of one. They're trying to say that they will use you as an individual. And they're working with chunks of big data to say, what do you like? So you will find today on Amazon and Flipkart, they say, look, do you want this? People who saw this, saw this, etc. But they want to come to a position where they can identify things that you like and things that you want. Apart from the fact that it's convenient and it's cheap, etc. Now this obviously is disrupting the whole business. I mean, Flipkart, when we started working for them, used to sell, uh, they used to do about five crores a year. And Flipkart in this big billion sale, today sold over a billion dollars. And this year they will do about seven to eight billion dollars of revenue. But their whole aim is that you want to get the customer, but you want to understand the customer. And can you have mass customized, unique customization? That means you can sell a product to a customer based on what he wants. Uh, the one on the top is banking. Uh, obviously, the first phase of banking was from brick and mortar to uh, ATMs, and now, of course, you're doing everything on banking uh, through the phone or through the internet, whether you send money, etc., etc. And the big wave that we've seen in the past is mobile banking, uh, money transfer through banking. Uh, Kenya, there's something called M-Pesa, which was very successful, and now you're doing that in India in a big way. So that's the other. Education. Uh, obviously, applies to institutions like Excel, etc. Uh, now you can have the best courses online. The Khan Academy is a good example. And now, uh, places like uh, you know, good universities like Harvard, etc., are trying to do online courses because you've got to kind of uh, meet the challenge of disruption. So these are all examples, you know, of disruption. Uh, now, the point is, why is this disruption happening, and what does it mean for us, and what are the lessons we can take out of it? Well, one of the reasons, of course. Uh, that we have seen is that you know generations have been able to think differently. Generations which created industrial revolution thought differently, and today it's digital generation thinks very differently. It's an example of Henry Ford, of course, and who introduced the model T much ahead of its time. And he said, somebody asked him, that look, why are you, you know, spending so much money? Uh, why didn't why did you ask people what they want? And he said, if I ask people what they want, they would tell me, get me faster horses. And this is exactly the answer that Steve Jobs has given. Many uh, years later, when he talks about that, I've not asked the people, but I'm trying to think differently. And today, obviously, from that model T, you have self driven cars uh, that Google is doing, that Elsa is doing, etc. So you are having a completely different thought. And this is true of various generations where these revolutions have happened, that people have thought differently. And today, of course, these are the guys, and I take one of the examples of people that we do work with is obviously you've got uh, Uber, uh, you've got uh, uh, Google, you've got uh, Facebook. Apple, uh, Airbnb, uh, Tesla, etc. And this is the generation which is thinking very, very differently. And this is the generation which is looking at how do we disrupt uh, consumers. And whenever there is a disruption, there is going to be a change. So people don't like change, people who oppose change. So there was this uh, set of people who were called Luddites. Luddites were people who were afraid of the industrial revolution, afraid that they would lose their jobs, and they would start smashing machines, they would start smashing factories. And the same thing that you see is the opposition to Uber, for example, in many cities and many countries. And that's exactly because disruption and change is not something that you immediately can get used to it. And first you fight change, and then if the change is too rapid, it's too important that you accept it. Now, from a marketing point of view, obviously what we've seen is that social media does empower all of us. I mean, in today's world, our customer that we are, A, we know more, B, we have more choices, we have more information. So you know this whole thing that we say that customer is king, customer is genuinely a king now. But what does it mean? Uh, what it means for companies, what it means for brands today, is that when you're talking about a brand, and Professor Salim is here, but one of the things today, in today's social media thing is that one of the meaning of the brand is what our experience of that is and what we are sharing. So just to give an example, we do some social media work for Samsung, and the Samsung S7, and all of us have known what it is, now, what people are talking about the Samsung S7 is defines what's happening to Samsung S7. That's the brand which has become. It's not what Samsung is doing, it's not the message it's saying, it's not the advertising, which it was much years back, many years back. It would be great ads from Procter and Gamble and Unilever, etc. which would define the brand. Here, 
consumers share experiences that they've had in the brand. And that's the big change that we're seeing now. That's the big change that we're seeing in the age of disruption. And just to continue from that, this is some statistics I got, I thought I'll put it. This is again for getting to 2015. By saying that brands obviously need to be social. And you know these answers, but I'm just putting some numbers. Because the old model of, of this communication was very linear. By saying the message, the interaction, the experience was given by the brand, given by the company. But today it's the social. And if you look at this, is data from the US, that 70% of, uh, you know, this was about 12,000 consumers who were asked in the survey by AC Nielsen. 70% said they are influenced by the peer community. And I know that because when I'm going to travel, I will look at TripAdvisor and I'll find out whether the place is good or not. So if 70% is influenced by peer community, that's very important. Brands have to be social. The other one we say is some 65% learn about the brands or offerings from social media, from the internet. And always, sometimes the question is asked, I say, where did you hear about us? What did you hear about us? Well, this is from social media. And obviously, the fact is that the population today is a young population. Uh, India, of course, is a case in point, but a large part of the world population is under 30, close to 50 percent. And the other data, and this is again American data, but I'm sure it can be extrapolated, is that a very few of these younger people trust ads, a very few of ads, TV ads generate ROI, and very few people watch the ads, many of them skip it, or they, you know, there's a technology in the US called TiVo that you can play that uh, episode later on. And that's the importance of social media, because people are not trusting traditional media, People are depending on what peers say, people are getting information about products and services about social media, then it's very important <coughs> that brands need to be social. And the other thing which is very important uh, in this whole digital age to be successful is that you've got to collaborate. You know, other, uh, in the previous world, people would work in silos, companies would do their own R&D. Today, there are two kinds of collaboration that's happening. One is that you're collaborating with each other. Uh, we, for example, are collaborating with a lot of startups because startups have the energy, the expertise, and we have the network and the connections. There is internal collaboration across disciplines, across geographies, because this is an inter-collaboration, and you will find this today, even among technology companies. Uh, you know, which was unheard of, those two technology companies are collaborating with each other, partnering with each other, because that is what, that's what we need to do uh, to prevent yourselves getting disruptive or to be able to ensure that you are able to adapt in this world. So one of the biggest risks, you can, you can do something, you can do something right, you can do something wrong, you can try again, but one of the biggest risks is doing nothing. <coughs> one of the things I wanted to say is that, you know, I've given you a lot of examples, I've given you some of the, some of the data, and I'm saying that, and this is some of the learning that I've had, is by saying, what's this evolutionary paradigm in this age of disruption? Why is it necessary for us to do what we have to do? Well, the first thing, of course, we're saying is that, look, we're moving from a product or service oriented culture. And the best example of that are airlines. I mean, all airline companies have the same aircraft, uh, uh, Airbus or Boeing. And not only do they have the same air, uh, aircraft, they have the same model, a 747 or a 737, etc. It's exactly the same. But why would you say Singapore Airlines and Emirates is better? Because you move to a service paradigm. The other whole thing is to move in from customer satisfaction to customer experience. I mean, satisfaction is passive. Satisfaction means are you satisfied? Yeah, I'm not unsatisfied. And I'll give you a good example of this experience. But now we're really talking about customer experience. I mean, Starbucks is a customer experience. Uh, the, third, the other thing, of course, is technology was a supporter. We used to use technology. But today, technology in some cases has become a key driver. All of you who are using the Uber app know that it is a technology led product. It's the technology which has defined the product. It's made the product simple to use, easy to use. So, technology is no longer a supporter, it's a driver. <coughs> Obviously, the movement from transaction to relationship, the best example is all the work that we do for e commerce companies. We did, uh, Flipkart was giving us some numbers. And they say, today if you go to Flipkart and you buy twice or thrice, and then you stop buying, they cost a lot of money for you. A, because they give you the products initially cheap, there is a huge cost of distribution, of marketing, etc., etc. If you buy some, you know, they've got some formula, which I'm not going to tell you, but if, if you buy only so, after so many times, so you buy 10 times, 12 times, 15 times, that's when they make money. If that's the case, that's when they make money, then it has to be a relationship, it can't be a transaction, because if you've got after the transaction, then they cost money and you never get any money. Process-centric, customer-centric, very, very important. In our own PPO business, in our own outside call center business, 
in our own customer care business. For many, many years, what we did is that you know, if we had to evaluate a call, we had a big checklist, and we evaluated the call based on all the parameters of the checklist. Was the agent polite? Did he say yes? Did he say thank you? Etc. Etc. And then you click mark and you say that look, yeah, the guy has done what he's done. Today we are saying, look, is the customer happy? Did his problem get resolved? The agent may be the politest guy, he may have said all the right things, and we might have marked him 80, 90, or 100 on that big box. But if the customer was not satisfied, if his product was not resolved, then it doesn't matter. And that's that whole movement of moving out from processes. A lot of companies, very good processes, Accenture, etc., but now the whole uh, movement is from process to customer. Process is fine, was the customer happy? Could we resolve this problem? Uh, asset focus to knowledge focus. Obviously, the whole impact is on knowledge. Why, why do you think uh, you know Facebook uh, got, or uh, why do you think WhatsApp got, uh, got what the price got? There's no asset. It's knowledge. In fact, Mr. Naran Murthy famously said, or it was he says that the only assets I have are people, and they go home every evening. I don't know if they're coming back next morning. So the whole focus, obviously, is a knowledge economy, is a digital data-led knowledge economy, and you're moving. And obviously, the round world, the flat world, the system of frequency book. But all of this is what companies need to understand. And you can look at any company which is successful, understand some of these parameters, and understand the fact that customer experience, technology is key. It has to be customer centric. The focus has to be on it. And if you don't, and you can take examples uh, for uh, lack of time and not going into every detail, but the ones which have failed in many of these parameters have been on the other side. As this example uh, was something that uh, you know, I adapted many years back. Uh, you know, this is uh, you want to buy some coffee, so you buy some coffee beans and you make you have some good filter coffee machine at home, and you buy it, and you've actually done some of the cost. The cost of a cup of coffee is about ninety pesos, and then you say, no, I want to go and buy some Nescafe or brew coffee or whatever, and there is three, four bucks for a cup of coffee. If you divide the uh, packet of coffee by the number of cups you can make. And then you say, I want to go to a local uh, you know, place where I want to have a cup of coffee, uh, place near a house, two, three kilometers, nine kilometers, some uh, coffee joint, that you pay 10, 15, 20, 25 bucks. In Starbucks, at least in Bombay, now you pay 155 bucks for the coffee. So the same coffee which you can buy for 90 pesos, good filter coffee at home, and people go from the south and make super filter coffee, you're paying 155 rupees for 90 pesos. But why are you doing it? Because in your mind, you move from you know, you come from a, uh, you really come from an experience, from a commodity, of you as a commodity, from a commodity to an experience. You said, this is the experience that I want to pay for. Or you move from a, you know, from a, <coughs> excuse me, from a transaction to a full present interaction. This is just one example, but you can look at millions of examples by saying that if I can focus on customer experience, if I can have an experience which right, I will A, have loyal customers, and number two, are the people who are willing to pay a premium. And really, this is uh, partly the, the, it's a chronology of the first one. And I'm, I'm going to give you some ages examples by saying, how are the, like, how the enterprise is moving? Do we know what's happening? One is, who are our clients today? Who will be our clients tomorrow? I mean, traditionally, we've had, for example, in the PPO business, a lot of telecom and financial services clients. These are the big guys who are outsourced. But today, our big clients will be e-commerce clients. Right? So the clients are changing. The movement of clients is changing. Do we know that? Do we understand that? You know, our clients like uh, Flipkart, Amazon, Snapdeal, Napco, and they've got, they've got huge, uh, you know, work for us. What are our service models today? What will be the models in future? Typically, the models in our case have been on an FT basis. That is, for every person who pay X, we used to call it bumps on seats. Now, the whole model is changing. Customers are saying we will pay for outcomes. We'll give you more control. Can you do A to B to C for us? And depending on the outcome that comes in, we'll pay for you. So the whole model has changed. So if you're stuck in the old model, you will have trouble. Who are our competitors today? Who will be our competitors tomorrow? I remember reading this in 89, I think it was professor's class. Uh, Theodore Levitt, marketing myopia, by saying, who's the competitor to Coke? You might be expecting that there are many others. And today, in any case, we look at data, the cater into the world, the health drink, etc. So for us also, the nature of our competition is changing rapidly. If we were just targeting uh, you know, other competitors, three or four known competitors, we might just get some sidelined because there are people who are doing analytics, who are doing social media, who are doing a lot of stuff, who are actually taking a business, who can take a business from us. Where are the margins coming from? 
today where the margin is coming from tomorrow, margins are changing. Like I said, our model was that you pay on an FT basis, you pay X rupees per person, today everything is changing. There is so much work happening in analytics. Again, I'll give you an example. You know, a lot of the analytics that we do uh, is what we call descriptive analytics. You just analyze what's happened with the MIS and you find out whether things happen right, wrong, what you need to do. <coughs> from that, uh, what is some is called predictive analytics. Can you predict? So we've got a lot of top insurance companies as our clients. And one of the things which is very important in insurance, uh, particularly those who do motor insurance and health insurance, because motor and health insurance, every year you can get, uh, you know, it's, it's renewable yearly, unlike life, which is long term. And therefore, it's very important for that the customers stay for a longer time. But you can use the data, you can use the analytics to take sure by saying which of these customers will move, which of these customers have a higher capacity to move. And how do you therefore, as a result of that, try to get more consistency, that is how you get to win. Exactly. So what we have done is looked at data for the last 10-12 years, looked at people who were churn depending on age, income, region, the size of ticket, and the whole aim is that, look, can we get more people to remain? That is going to give us more margins, rather than doing the normal work that we're going, which is the first thing. So the question is, very large margins came. What, is, what makes us unique today, what makes us unique tomorrow? Apart from doing a lot of work that we do in customer care, we are today doing, we have a social media product called Lisa, which is a very powerful product. We do a bunch of analytics. I talked about predictive analytics, we have a predictive picture, but then you go one step ahead and you do what is called prescriptive analytics. So once you've been able to predict how you mitigate it, what do you do? If you say these are the guys who are going to churn out, what do you need to do to keep them consistent? And therefore, it's important that we continue to remain unique. We continue to do stuff which makes us different. Now, we have, there are different stages of transformation. Uh, what we've done in ages follows some of this. It's not what is exactly, but I thought therefore I'll put it. You see, for us also, we were a very traditional. 20 years back, we were what is called a call center company. I mean, there is no more a call center company. It takes calls and answers, questions, etc. Today, we've become a digital led company. And how did this transformation happen? I mean, obviously, initially, it was business as usual. I said, yeah, we're doing well, we're growing, we're acquiring, we're becoming a billion dollars, all that's fine. But then we realized that business is changing. Disruption, all of that I spoke is happening. We ourselves can get, get disrupted. And therefore, we said, let's do a pilot, let's understand what we need to do. And then we formed uh, what is called a cross functional team and says, what are the things that customers are looking at? What are the things that we need to do? <coughs> and having formed a cross functional team, we then had a, digit, uh, a separate division which was focusing on digital innovation, and that has now become the norm. And if you read at the bottom again, I can't. I give you the thing, you read the exact thing. It really talks to that process. And let me give you a good example. We are in the realm of customer care. We are in the realm of customer satisfaction. Today, if you go by Jet Airways, they will give you a customer care form for the flight that they will ask you to fill it. Uh, it happened to me last night, and I fly very Jet Airways very often. And that customer care form is about 20, 22 questions, and it takes a lot of time. So yesterday actually, so every time I start giving some excuses, I think I'll do it next time or I don't have a pen because it's very wrong and wrong. The other thing where I uh, travel often is Taj Hotels and they will give you a customer care form about 7 to 10 days after you travel. In those 10 days you write hundreds of emails and you will find a very difficult answer. And I have a friend in Taj and he says that the response rate is less than 1%. So the whole question is why are we wasting time doing such a case where the rate of response rate is 1%. So, and I give you two examples of Jet and Taj because these are supposed to be good customer companies. What we did is we said, look, this is our job, this is our lead thing, it's customer satisfaction. Can we digitize the whole thing? Can we disrupt by doing this? <coughs> so we, what we did is that uh, we partnered with a startup called Litmus, so we have some equity in that company. And what Litmus has done is that they have done the whole thing, they have digitized the whole thing. As example, we work with, uh, uh, we work with uh, companies in quick service business, in the retail business, uh, so whether it's a Domino's or is it a, a landmark or a lifestyle, so what happens is that you shop at any of these places or you've eaten at Domino's and then you go to pay, so when you're paying, you're paying by a credit card or in some of these cases you have a loyalty card which is all linked to the database. So when you're paying, you get a hyperlink on your, um, on your smartphone by saying thank you for uh, you know shopping with the landmark or lifestyle or whatever it is. Uh, we value your patronage very much and uh, can you just you know, answer a few questions? 
it should take exactly two minutes. And we've timed it. It is two minutes. And because we know that if it's two minutes, the guy says it will do. And the other thing is that when he has to answer the song, he doesn't have to write anything. He just uses his index finger. And he then actually has a scale from minus five to plus five. So he uses the index finger, and if it's very bad, it's minus five. If it's very good, it's plus five. And we made it interesting and funny, so it's ouch or terrible if it's minus five, plus five, it's not, you know, so that. But this process is intuitive. So if he is raised minus five, then immediately there's a drop down menu which asks a few more questions by saying, look, you hated it, you found it terrible, then tell us a little more. And, uh, what, and, and at the end, it has got some space so you can give some comments if you do want to uh, in about 100 characters. But the whole aim is to make it a very simple, to make it real time, and to make it interesting, and so that you don't spend more than two minutes. And what we are what we're doing also is that not just we do it real time, uh, we also are able to answer back in real time if we can do something. So you ask something and we answer immediately. That is customer experience. That is solving the customer problem. And our whole interest was that can we get the response rate up to 50, 60 percent from the one percent example I gave you on that? Now, because a lot of these places are in malls today, uh, what we've done is that we uh, and then say that look and thank you so much for doing it and we know you're spending two minutes and by the way we give you 50 percent off from Starbucks if you answer that. And the Starbucks, because it's a mall, is just down the hall, so it's 50 yards from here. So guys have a picture, I'll have a Starbucks and I'll answer it. And we've got response rates up to 50, 60 percent. So what therefore we've done is this whole customer experience is no longer a sheet of paper, it's digitized, it's immediate, it's real time, it's answered real time. One of our clients is a mobile store, which is a, a company owned, uh, which is a, a brand owned uh, by a parent company which has 600 mobile stores in India, which is actually the largest organized mobile store company, and he's got stores across the country. <coughs> and we've instituted this uh, in all his stores. And the, and the CEO of that company, who is a good friend of mine, he said, look, something come one day. I've got a Tuesday meeting, and he's got a Tuesday meeting with the executive committee. And what he does is that he just puts this data on the wall. So he's got data on 700 stores. He's got real time data whether his customers like that store, hate it, etc., etc. Ones that are very good can be highlighted in terms of regions, etc., like all the details. And then he can further get into classifications of which, what's the age group, what's the gender, who liked it, who did, etc. And he says, look, this, I run my company through this, through your application. Because my store managers may not give me the information right or wrong, but I've got customer feedback instant. And he said, this is to me my most important thing of running the store. And obviously now we've all got smarter, so we correlate this to sales store sales by saying if your customer side is very good, hopefully your sales is good and so on and so forth. So this is an example of digitizing the entire customer service. This is an example of digital transformation. And now we have got this product Liquid. We're talking to ICICI back. I was in Australia uh, till Friday. We've got two clients, we've got uh, you know, two big Australian clients. This is something which is disrupted. This is the way into the future. I gave you this example of a mobile store. Again, it's a store, as we said, which is part of our group. And they had a major problem, and I was on the board for many years. And uh, that is that they, their disruption is equally interesting, and I thought maybe I should share that. So they have 600 stores, brick and mortar stores. Uh, lots of people, and they, they, they want stores in good locations. So lots of people go to the stores. Take a look at the products, and in front of the store manager or front of this, they're on the net and they're looking at the same price on Flipkart or Amazon or wherever, which is much cheaper. And they say, okay, uh, they just want to see the product. So the mobile store is becoming a great display unit. You know, everybody is fantastic. People are coming and seeing, uh, you know, free of cost, which is the product, which is the brand, and then, and in, actually, and that, that they do not even going home. In front of the store guy, they're saying they're ordering from others. So if you can't, we can join. Them. So what these guys did is first they said, okay, we will also be a partner with a Flipkart or Amazon or a Slam. So they are getting discounts, uh, you know, we will so do the same. And now what the mobile store does, so if you go to the mobile store and you're checking things, the guy will say, sir, there's the internet, and we've got an internet kiosk inside the store, he says, please check the price and it's not being a Flipkart. <coughs> and we will match that price. Because they're getting, because they have now become a partner, you know, these are all, these are all, uh, you know, seller communities, which is a Flipkart or Amazon. So they are able to sell at the same price. But what they also do is they said, look, uh, when we buy accessories, when we buy some of the other stuff, and typically when you go, you will buy a cover, you will buy an accessory, you will buy insurance, and the margin for those are very high. So A, he's matched this thing, and he's able to sell. Then these guys did another thing. They said, okay, so people who are coming to the store, we're not going to let them go, we're going to sell them at the store. 
So they also become partners of Flipkart and Amazon and all that. But if you guys want these sites, if you want these sites, there are many, many sellers. How do you choose? How do you find out which one to go? You know, Mr. X, Mr. Y, Mr. Z, all selling the same product, but again, it forms the many. And these guys came out with a concept called FEP. FET is fast expert delivery, or they call it fastest expert delivery. Which means today if you order a mobile phone in general, it takes you two, three days for that mobile phone to come. But these guys said that in 190 cities in India, we give you two hours. That's how we said we will differentiate from the rest. For that, we're going to pay a little more, but the mobile phone will come in two hours. And for the dealers, experts, they said, look, we won't get just some people to deliver, we'll get people who know. People who understand about the phone to come to your house and they've done a lot of interesting stuff. So some, before somebody comes to your house, then the message is a beef and the photograph of that person because in India now with all the uh, law and order and you know people get worried who's coming to your house, so they have actually the photo of this guy that Mr. X is coming, Mr. Y is coming, so it's okay. Number two, Mr. X and Y is pretty well educated. So what he's doing is that he's, for example, saying, Can I change move all your contacts to this new phone? Which is something all of us want to do, some of us don't know how to do it. So so they said, look, A we will convert this brick and mortar. Into a brick and mortar, but we will also convert it to be part of this whole e-commerce platform. So we will match the price because they are in e-commerce. And secondly, because there are some 20 e-commerce partners selling phones on Flipkart or Snapdeal or Jungle or whatever it is, we will be different to that FED concept. So if you go into the sites, if you go to Jungle today, you will find a mobile store and it's a two hours delivery or one hour delivery or something like that. So you have again differentiated yourself. And that's exactly what you need to do. You need to transform yourself based on all of this. So therefore the question is, and this is the question we put to ourselves, we put to our clients, we put that you want to be a digital dinosaur, which means you are living in the past, you want to be a digital immigrant, which means you just come in, or you want to be a native, like many of our kids, uh, my daughter is very young, but she's you know, an expert. So therefore the question is that today with all the disruption happening, are you going to be part of that community, or are you still going to you know, bury your head in the sand, and are you going to be a, like an ostrich? <coughs> now the other question we have is that look, how, this is again, I have given an ageist example, I don't know if you can read everything but I am going to read it out to you. What are the key ingredients for fostering this culture? If you want to be digital, you have got to foster a culture of innovation, you have got to get this thing, this won't happen by itself. We have not transformed ourselves from a contact center company to an analytics company to a social media company as well as to a litmus kind of company just by itself. And what we have done is, we say, look, it's, it's very important that you reward ideas. You, you look at ideas and you look at ideas not just top down but from bottom up. So any idea, and particularly we encourage our frontline people to give ideas, they are the ones talking with customers. Any idea is welcome, we look at it and we reward it. We reward it in the sense is that we, even if we don't adopt it, we are able to uh, give you an acknowledgement and say, look, good thinking. And these ideas, we want them to come not just top down but bottom up. We've created innovation cells, uh, which are people who are really looking at the future, looking at what is to be done, are looking at artificial intelligence, looking at automation, looking at machine learning, looking at all of that. <coughs> and we must have a vision that this is what I want to do. So our vision is today we want to be at the forefront of the new digital revolution. And we need to do what it takes. And a lot of that includes collaboration, it includes partnership with others, because alone we may not be able to do everything on our own, which is why we partner with startups. We are partnering with other companies and therefore when you look at this grid, you have got to do a few things, you do not necessarily do all. Can you foster collaboration? Can you reward contribution? Can you uh, look at ideas? Can you employ technology as an enabler, not just as a support? If you, are, if you are able to look at all this, you will be able to survive, you will be able to thrive in the disruption environment. Otherwise, you will get disrupted. So therefore, you have two choices. One is, you want to be a dinosaur, you want to bury your head in the sand, and this is a whole group of an American company or any company in the world says, we need to rethink our strategy of hoping that the internet will just go away. Now obviously the internet will not just go away, and therefore what do you need to do uh, to ensure that we are at the forefront of this disruption? I'll give you another example. We talked about business models. We've completely changed a lot of business models. Uh, and something that you can relate to Amazon. So we, we do a lot of we are, we are doing a lot of work for Amazon in South Africa, for example. And our entire model is based on various outcomes that we will do for Amazon. Not just in terms of sales. And of course, if the customer is buying and we're getting up with that. Today we want to predict. So so what, what does Amazon say? 
let's say a person like you or me, they're spending, let's take any amount, you say I spent in a year 20 lakhs on all the stuff that I want to buy, or 30 lakhs, or 10 lakhs, whatever number. Amazon says I can meet 90% of your things. You possibly will not buy a car from Amazon, you might still go and look at the car, but 90% of the stuff that you want is available there. So they are saying, and they are looking at purchase, they say, why do this guy purchase a thousand rand, five hundred rupees, but 90% of what he wants, I can do it. So our goal is, how do we get to that 90%? If we can get to that 90%, if you exactly know what you are buying, then you are buying, buy your rights. Those are the outcomes that they are looking at. And we are saying, fine, we will work with you on those outcomes and reward us on those outcomes. So that's how this model is changing. So it's changing on the work of the outcomes, it is changing when you are digitizing the entire experience. It is changing when you are looking at big data and looking at analysis. It is changing when you are doing social media. So we have a social media product for Lisa. Lisa is listen, interact, etc, etc. <coughs> but Lisa is just a nice name given around it. What it does is of course, any company, right, it's, let's say XLR, right? it will go through all the web. Or it will go through, it'll have a crawler, it will go through whatever the web XLR has mentioned. And it will give you the comments. But that's the easy part. And then it uses a lot of data to then get into what are people saying in terms of intensity, what are people saying in terms of numbers, what are people saying which will make a material difference, what are people saying which is fine, which is good to know, what are people saying in terms of age group. Uh, in Twitter, uh, what we do is that we even go a step further and let's say that you have 1 million Twitter followers and he has 10,000 Twitter followers, both of you are important but the 1 million guy is more important. So we actually are able to even look at, give a Twitter rating score to each person. And you know, so we are we doing some work for British Airways and many of you knew that, that some, some match in the US and Sachin was coming back from the US to get a lot of extra luggage and he told British Airways, look, I've got a lot of luggage, I'm coming back and he said, look, who are you and, you know, what do you do? And he tweeted. And uh, we were doing some other work for British Airways, not the social media work, and we immediately pointed out that, look, this is going to be a, because of the kind of uh, response that we are getting from the others, the fact that such a village we just we give it a score. I think this is an important comment, right? We are we not doing the follow-up. We know they did something. But those are the things that we've got that we've got to look at. Those are the things that we've got to move. So if you don't, if you bury your hand in the sand, you have a problem. And as Brian saw, as the guy who got this digital provenism, it's the beginning of the talk said, disruption is either going to happen to you or because of you. And obviously what you want is that disruption should happen because of you and it's not going to happen to you. So you don't want to be the, the, the Nokia's of the world, the, the Kodak's of the world, the Mans and Nokia's of the world, but you want to be the Uber's of the world, the Airbnb's of the world. And, and, and again, that's whole story of competition that we talked about. I mean, did any hotel say if their competition, Hilton would say the competition would be Marriott or it would be intercontinental, but they never thought the competition would be Airbnb or car companies. Uh, you know, taxi companies never thought that Uber would be a competition. So the question